Thanks to Audible for keeping Legal Eagle in the air. Take off the robes, please. Yeah, so it is absolutely true that they wore judicial robes trying to get the ire of Judge Hoffman. In response, the judge did in fact uh, issue uh, contempt citations against them. Hey Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer. And today we are covering the trial of the Chicago 7, which was written and directed by Aaron Sorkin. Believe it or not, this is actually a new movie. And not only is it a new movie, but it's a new legal movie. It's like the before times. So I'm really excited to take a look at this movie that involves one of the most famous trials in the 1960s. And uh, yeah, let's get to it. December 30th. All those whose birthday falls on December 30th. President Johnson announced new monthly draft totals increasing to 35,000 43,000 51,000. Yeah, it's interesting that in the public consciousness, for some reason in modern times, maybe it's just me, but I think we tend to associate the Vietnam War with Richard Nixon, but for the most part, it was Johnson who really escalated things in Vietnam and instituted the draft. Later on, I assume we're gonna get to the actual protests themselves. Everyone's protesting Johnson and the Democratic nominees because they were the ones that were largely responsible for the escalation in Vietnam. And that's why everyone got arrested. Eventually, Nixon comes in as this president that's going to withdraw from Vietnam, which he eventually does in the second term. But for the most part, the Democrats were the party that were pro-Vietnam at the time. If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam. What we need in the United States is not hatred, but is love and wisdom. So I ask you tonight to return home, to say a prayer for the family, Martin Luther King. Yeah, it's also easy to forget that Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were shot just months apart from each other. And Kennedy was shot right around the time that he won, I think it was the day that he won the California primary for the Democratic nomination. And it's one of the great counterfactuals in the world to think about what would have happened if Robert Kennedy had won the Democratic nomination, if he hadn't been assassinated before that. When we get to the protests and the trial itself, uh, eventually Hubert Humphreys is the one that's nominated for the Democratic nomination for president, and he wasn't an anti-war protest. And historians think that if Humphreys had been an anti-war candidate in 1968, that he would have beaten Richard Nixon, but he wasn't and he lost. Section 2101 of Title 18. That's the federal law that was broken. That's the Rap Brown law. In conspiracy to cross state lines in order to incite violence. Okay. For the maximum of 10 years, we won all 10. For whom, sir? The all-star team. Okay, so this is really interesting. And I think this is kind of a throwaway line. Schultz here, who is the prosecutor, talks about the H. Rap Brown law. H. Rap Brown was the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. In 1967, he gave a speech to a few dozen people in Cambridge, Maryland, and the quote that he said was something like, it's time for Cambridge to explode, we're gonna have to burn America down, and then the group of people exchanged gunfire with the police, and it's sort of an open question who started that. The H. Rap Brown law was a law that was introduced by Strom Thurmond, who is notorious notorious for being a sort of a racist senator from the South. When the Civil Rights Act of 1968 was passed or was attempted to be passed, there was obviously quite a lot of pushback. At the time, there was a lot of white fright, not only people protesting the war, but also what people saw as outside agitators. And it was a law that was meant to prevent people from coming out of state and basically inciting violence. Often when you're dealing with federal laws, <laughs> the way that you overcome the, the Commerce Clause of the US Constitution and allow Congress to actually legislate something is you say that when you come out of state or you cross state lines, then that's when the law applies. In order to pass the civil rights law, along with, I think it was a housing bill, they had to be passed with this rider that was added by Strom Thurmond. This was 1969 at the time. No one had ever used this law and it was clearly passed for political reasons. The fact that Bobby Seale, the Black Panther, was even included in this group of people that actually organized the protests in 1968, that was politicized. The law that they were prosecuted under was completely politicized. It was, it's as close as America has really ever come to a political show trial.
Okay, so a couple things. Here, uh, the movie's telling us this is district court, so it's a federal courthouse, because like I said, we're dealing with a federal law here. This was the H. Rap Brown Anti-Rioting Act. On top of it, the chant that they're chanting here, I don't know if that continued into the trial, but famously, when the police cracked down on the protesters at the Democratic Convention, the, the protesters themselves, as they were basically being beaten by the police, were chanting, the whole world is watching, the whole world is watching. I assume that that probably continued on even after the protest itself, but that, that chant famously originated with the protests themselves. I want you all to meet uh, a new addition to the defense team. This is Leonard Wineglass, one of this country's most talented First Amendment litigators. Phil, can you tell us the status of Charles Gary? Go ahead, sign. Can you tell us the status of Charles Gary? Charles Gary is still in the hospital. You should contact his office for information. Uh, Marjorie. Does that mean you're representing Bobby Seale today? Oh, no, it's very important that it be understood that uh, for his own protection, his own protection, I will not be acting as Bobby Seale's attorney today. All right, so they're hinting at a whole bunch of different things here. Number one is that uh, Kunstler and Weinglass were the main trial counsel for the Chicago 7, but also there were dozens of lawyers that were involved here. It was not just these two guys. And they're hinting that a man named Charles Gary is not present. This is a famous episode in federal litigation where a lot of the members of the Chicago 7, or you know, really it's the Chicago 8 if you include Bobby Seale, wanted Charles Gary, a famous litigator, to represent them. In particular, Bobby Seale, the Black Panther wanted Charles Gary to represent him. And he was in the hospital because he needed gallbladder surgery. So he was literally in a hospital bed. And so it was a huge question as to who was representing whom at the start of the trial. I understand why they're trying to smoke Abby, Jerry, and Hayden, even Rennie and Dellinger, but for the life of me, I can't figure out what the two of us are doing here. I feel exactly the same way, but this is the Academy Awards of protest, and as far as I'm concerned, it's an honor just to be nominated. Okay, this hints at something else that's probably kind of important, is that because this is kind of a show trial and very politicized, the prosecutors were cramming a whole bunch of disparate groups into the defense table here. You had the Yippies that were led by Abby Hoffman, who thought this was all kind of a joke. You have the SDS led by Tom Hayden, who were very, very anti-war. You have these local guys, Weiner and Freunds, who were not nationally known figures. They were just involved in the local planning, but not really the overarching national campaign. You've got Bobby Seale, who's the head of the Black Panthers at this point, and then you have David Dellinger, who I think is involved with the MOB, the like student mobilization against the, the war. And they're all on, on trial for a conspiracy to uh, create a, a riot. Weiner and, and Freunds were completely the odd men out, and it's sort of crazy that all of these people were prosecuted at the same time when they couldn't have less to do with each other, really. They barely agreed that everyone should be against the uh, the Vietnam War. But that's kind of where all the, uh, the cooperation ended. All rise. Hmm, okay. So if this is actually the start of the trial itself, if we're done with the pretrial stuff, then at this point, it was already sort of a circus and most if not all of the defendants uh, refused to stand to recognize the judge, which was actually a subject of a lot of the contempt charges that Judge Julius Hoffman would uh, hand down to a bunch of the defendants. Especially the Yippies with uh, Abby Hoffman were absolutely dead set on making this thing as wild, uh, as much like a circus, and showing the least amount of respect possible. Move to reinstate testimony. Over the road. Among the many things that they did, they refused to stand for large portions of the trial. 69 CR 180, United States of America versus David Dillinger, Renard C. Davis, Thomas Hayden, Abbott Hoffman, Jerry C. Rubin, Lee Weiner, John R. Froens, and Bobby G. Seale for trial. Are the people ready to make opening arguments? We are, Your Honor. I don't have my lawyer here. It's not your turn to speak. My trial's begun without my lawyer. 
Okay, so that's Bobby Seale, the, the famous Black Panther, and they're compressing a lot of stuff into this statement here because we haven't even been able to see the, the pretrial stuff that happened before the court. A lot of stuff that happens in motion practice between counsel and the judge and you're choosing the jury and there's so many things that goes into the pretrial. And here, it was a huge, huge issue about who represented Bobby Seale. By the time that the, the trial starts, several of the pretrial lawyers have already been held in contempt and Judge Hoffman has sent them to jail without bail, which caused over a hundred lawyers to write an amicus brief where you're you're just writing a brief as a friend of the court. You're not someone that is actually has a vested interest in, in the trial itself. But hundreds of lawyers wrote in to the judge and said, this is crazy. You know, why are you jailing the lawyers for the defendants here? And so it was a complete open question as to who represented Bobby Seale. William Kunstler, the main trial counsel for the defendants, explicitly said he was not representing Seal. Mr. Seal is here without legal representation. I don't care for your general tone. Arguably, Seal was completely unrepresented for most of this trial and was vociferously disputing the fact that they were moving forward without someone representing him. I mean, this is part of the whole mess that led to the circus-like atmosphere of this trial. It's crazy. Mr. Schultz. Good morning. My name is Richard Schultz. I'm an assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Illinois. All right, classic trope, entering the well without permission and going right up to the jury box. You have to ask for permission or obviously the bailiff will tackle you. There's actually one real life exchange that was in the transcript that didn't make it into the movie that touches on this. So William Kunstler is the main defense lawyer and he was at the lectern, but he was sort of leaning on the lectern kind of at the side of the lectern and Judge Hoffman basically yelled at him saying that Mies van der Rohe designed the lectern, who's a famous architect, and he's not allowed to even lean on it. It's disrespectful. Really in this movie, we see the tip of the iceberg in terms of the judge's animosity towards not only the defense counsel, but also the idea that he was somehow racist for chastising Bobby Seale and uh, that he was constantly the butt of the joke. Anytime there was laughter, he basically issued a contempt citation to the defense counsel. And he was always worried that people were laughing at him. And he was always worried that people thought he was racist. And he went out of his way in sort of a racist way to say that he wasn't racist. And he would kept saying, you know, I've got black friends. And I mean, it was just really, really obvious stuff where he was trying to make a point to show that he wasn't racist and yet demonstrating that he was uh, at least mildly racist for the time. Mr. Schultz. The radical left, that's all. The radical left in different costumes. That's probably improper for an opening statement. These defendants had a plan and a plan among two or more people is a conspiracy. The defendants crossed state lines to execute their plan. That's why we're in federal court. And the plan was to incite a riot. And there's one thing you already know, they succeeded. Yeah, so there was a, a riot, there's no doubt about that, but uh, several investigations showed that it was the police that started the riot. Uh, there was a, a congressional or Illinois state investigative report called the Walker Report that basically concluded that it was the police, not the protesters who started the riot in 1968. And it's interesting because here there are two separate types of charges for the most part. One is a conspiracy charge to cross state lines to create a riot. The other charges were just sort of general incitement to riot charges that regardless of whether there was a plan or conspiracy that they did cause a riot to happen. And the reason that you can charge all of these people together and try them together is the conspiracy charge because generally defendants have a right to their own trial. But when the government alleges a conspiracy, then you can lump them all together and it's much easier to use statements to show a plan amongst this group of people, which didn't really exist. They are a really disparate group of people that yes, got together for this protest or what they called the love-in, but it's very unlikely that there was any kind of thought out plan to actually incite a riot ahead of time. Your Honor. I'm not with these guys. I never even met most of them until the indictment. We will have order. There are eight of us here. We and they're signed will have up order. and free, free to Chicago seven. I'm not with them. Mr. Marshall, saying it's a conspiracy. will I you see Mr. Seal? Until Seale. the indictment. And speaking frankly, the U.S. attorney wanted a Negro defendant to scare the jury. I was thrown in to make the group look scarier. I came to Chicago. I made a speech. Mr. Seal. I had a chicken pot pie. 
went to the airport and I flew back to Oakland. And that's why they call it the Chicago. Get your hands off me. Charge Mr. Seal with one count of contempt of court. So contempt of court, it was a huge issue in this trial. By the end of the trial, there were 175 different counts of contempt. And between four of the defendants and two of the lawyers, some people were sentenced to more than four years in jail as a result of the contempt violation that the judge handed down. I mean, it's crazy that, that people would be sentenced to four years in jail for contempt of court for things that happened in court, not even the things that they were alleged to have done outside of court. Again, it contributed to this idea that this was a political show trial. Rumors were that the prosecutors really, really wanted to get Judge Hoffman and they were ecstatic when they did get him because he was just bringing down the hammer on all of these uh, different defendants. So the question is, what do you do if you're the defense counsel and the judge hates you and is really taking it out on you and your client. Really, William Kunstler probably should be the star of this show because this movie is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of how much the judge really hated Kunstler and the rest of the defendants. Kunstler was fighting back for months and months. And as a result, he was issued dozens of contempt citations along with the defendants him themselves. The only thing that you can do is just set your record. You know that a lot of these rulings are not gonna stand, that you're gonna be able to appeal it. And if the judge is poisoning the well, then you just keep setting the record. You make your objections, you state your grounds for the, uh, the objection so that when the trial is over and if there is a conviction, you can go to the Court of Appeals and, and point to these things. Frankly, this, this movie doesn't show just how far Kunstler was willing to go to fight this judge who absolutely hated him and his clients. What are you wearing? It's an homage to you, Your Honor. Do you have clothes underneath there? Yes. Hold on. Yes. Take off the robes, please. Yeah, so this was one of the many antics that Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin pulled during the course of this trial. It is absolutely true that they wore judicial robes trying to get the ire of Judge Hoffman. They were not wearing police uniforms underneath, but in response to wearing those robes, the judge did in fact uh, issue uh, contempt citations against them. Did you issue the permits? No, I did not. And what, if anything, did Abby Hoffman say when you denied the request for the permits? Mr. Stahl, you need to understand something. There's gonna be a festival of life in Grand Park and it will be held during the convention. Bands will play rock music. There will be public fornication. Likely some of it with the wives and mistresses of delegates. Psychedelic <laughs> long-haired leftists will consort with dope users. And we're gonna insist that the next president of the United States stop sending our friends to be slaughtered. These things are gonna happen whether you give us the permit or not. The hotels will be filled with delegates. Where will people sleep? Some people will sleep in tents, others will live frivolously. Well, how many people are coming here? A lot. What's a lot? 1,000? 2,000? 10,000. Jesus Christ. Right? <laughs> So the, the permit issue was a really big deal because this is a really weird trial in terms of the evidence that was presented and allowed to be presented. You're trying to show that there's this conspiracy ahead of time to cause a riot, to incite violence. So a lot of what these defendants said and did goes to whether there was a plan to create violence or rioting before it actually happened. And you can imagine that permitting is a big issue here. There's a lot of people, a lot of historians that think that if the permits had been granted, they would have had things like sanitation and electricity and the bands that they had lined up to play would have had a PA system, which could have calmed the crowd down. And of course the permits were rejected. He said, we must understand that as we go forth to try to move the reprobate politicians, Your Honor. our cowardly Congress, the jive double lip talking jive, Nixon. Double lip talking Nixon. You make me sound like one funky cat. Thank you, sir. Last warning, Mr. Seal. Did he say anything else? He said the revolution at this time is directly connected to organized guns and force. No more questions. Jive double lip talking. Funky, funky cat. Would the defense like to cross examine the witness? Yes. I'm sitting here saying that I would like to cross-examine a witness. Only lawyers can address a witness. My lawyer is Charles Gary. I'm tired of hearing that. Couldn't care less what you're tired of. What did you say? 
I said it would be impossible for me to care any less what you are tired of, and I demand to cross-examine the witness. Sit in your chair and be quiet, and don't ever address this court in that manner again. So this incident actually happened. This is one of the more infamous uh, incidents in uh, litigation uh, history around this time. It actually happened earlier. Uh, it was not related to the death of Fred Hampton, but obviously Bobby Seale wanted a lawyer and the court wasn't allowing him to have his counsel of choice. After a number of disruptions, Judge Hoffman really did put Bobby Seale in chains, bound and gagged. And what's not portrayed in this movie is that it wasn't an isolated incident, but he stayed in chains for days. You can imagine that the other defendants were pissed. The jury's sort of tainted at this point. This could have been its own movie. It sort of gets short shrift in, in this particular movie, but it actually happened, and it's not a shining moment for the judicial system. State your name. William Ramsey Clark. Do you swear the testimony you give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You would think that this was pure movie magic. It's made up that they were able to call the former attorney general for the United States to be a witness in the trial. It actually happened. Interestingly, what this movie portrays that the questions are asked, he gives great answers for the defense about the political nature of this trial. And the judge does exclude the testimony. The jury never got to hear the testimony of Ramsey Clark. This is interesting because generally you would think that what another police department did, or in this case, the attorney general's office did isn't really probative or relevant to the idea that these people are guilty or not. But there is a defense of being singled out for political reasons. And I assume that that would have been an affirmative defense in this particular case. What actually happens is that while Ramsey Clark did not get to testify in this trial, eventually after the appeal and a retrial, he was able to testify uh, later on. He testified, but it, the jury never got to hear it. It's interesting what they're not showing here because there were hundreds of witnesses and because the defendant's states of mind were at issue, they called a whole bunch of people who participated in the protest. Witnesses like Allen Ginsberg, the poet, Dick Gregory, the comedian, folk singers, Timothy Leary, the Harvard professor who was famous for experimenting with LSD. The testimony that they gave was insane. People sang songs, they chanted in the middle of the courtroom, and this was the testimony in front of the judge and jury. This was a bonkers trial from start to finish. <laughs> All right, now it's time to give the trial of the Chicago 7 a grade for legal realism. On the one hand, a lot of the dialogue that's in this movie is almost verbatim from the trial transcripts of things that actually happened. And sure, they're condensing things to fit it into a two hour movie, but it seems like they got a lot of the period details correct. On the other hand, there are a few movie tropes uh, moving around the well, but for the most part, this is a pretty accurate movie, both from the legal perspective and the historical perspective as well. So I'll give The Trial of the Chicago 7 an A minus for accuracy. This is about as accurate as you'll get for a two hour a movie condensing six months worth of trial. To prepare for this review, I read tons of books and court pleadings, but one of my favorite things was listening to amazing voice actors read the most exciting excerpts from the trial transcript on Audible in The Trial of the Chicago 7, the official transcript. The amazing cast includes Jeff Daniels, Luke Kirby, and J.K. Simmons, who plays Judge Hoffman and is completely terrifying. I got federal court PTSD just from listening to him. And while the movie is good, the reenactment on Audible is even better because truth is stranger than fiction. The movie just couldn't do justice just to how many crazy things actually happened in the trial and how heated the arguments were between Kunstler and Judge Hoffman. Trust me, the audiobook is fantastic. It's better than a John Grisham novel. I use Audible almost every day. It's by far the best source of audio entertainment. And they recently launched a new plan called Audible Plus that gives you full access to their Plus catalog, which is filled with thousands and thousands of select originals, audiobooks, podcasts, workouts, and even guided meditations. And now is the best time to try Audible Plus because with their holiday offer, it's only $4.95 a month for the first six months and after that, it's only $7.95 a month to download and stream their thousands of audiobooks and originals in the Plus catalog. And with Audio Plus, you can download or stream without limit. Just go to audible.com slash Legal Eagle or text Legal Eagle to 500-500. And be sure to check out the audiobook version of the real life trial of the Chicago 7. Again, just go to audible.com slash Legal Eagle to get the holiday offer on Audible Plus. Plus, clicking on the link in the description really helps out this channel. So, do you agree with my analysis? Leave your objections in the comments and Check out this playlist over here with all of my real lawyer reactions, including Legally Blonde and Liar Liar. So just click on this playlist and I'll see you 
in court.